There was a famous patch of woods in Germany that used to be called Der Singenderwald, or the Singing Forest. This small stand of trees was located near a town called the Beach Forest. Sounds like a place right out of Tolkien, you know? Something like Frodo and Sam walked through the Singing Forest to meet Galadriel. Mystical, beautiful. You might recognize the place's name better if it's in German. Buchenwald. Yeah. Perhaps now you understand why the place called the Singing Forest was not mystical or beautiful. It was one of the most notorious concentration camps in Germany. Historians believe that 60,000 people were killed at Buchenwald. However, the total may be considerably higher, considering the number of inmates that flooded into and out of the camp during the chaotic death marches at the end of World War II. The singing forest did not sing. The sounds from the trees were the hangman's ropes rubbing into the branches as men's bodies swung from them. Welcome to History on Fleet. Today, we unravel the menacing strategies that the Nazis wielded to instill terror and decimate spirits. We expose the secrets enshrouded within an ominous forest. Most hauntingly, we'll delve into the terrifying legacy of the infamous Witch of Buchenwald, Ilse Koch. A Camp to Instill Terror Officially, Buchenwald was known as KZ Buchenwald, KZ was the German phonetic acronym for Konzentrationslager, concentration camp. The camp was built in 1937 and was made to house the ever-increasing numbers of people who found themselves rounded up and, after a short or non-existent trial, were sent to camps being erected throughout Germany. At the war's end, Buchenwald and another well-known camp, Dachau, were liberated by American forces. The images taken by these journalists and some soldiers made an indelible mark on American and British readers and audiences as they read accounts of the camps in the newspapers and saw newsreels in movie theaters. These were the first images of the Holocaust that most people had ever seen, and in the weeks and months after the war, images of Buchenwald and other smaller camps were what came to mind for most people in the West. Thousands of bodies stacked like firewood. Corpses in various states of decay lay about just inches from people who looked barely alive themselves, overcrowded barracks, lice, maggots, smells, and misery everywhere they looked. As in Dachau, the first concentration camp, the first inmates of Buchenwald were generally members of one of these groups, criminals, communist party members, Jehovah's Witnesses, Protestant, and Catholic clergy who had spoken out against the regime, trade union officials and others the Nazis believed were or might in the future be a threat. Many teachers and professors were thrown into camps like Buchenwald, denounced by their students or parents for making anti-Nazi remarks, etc. The Buchenwald camp was a men's camp, but the relatively few Jewish men who found themselves there before World War II began and the Holocaust entered its most deadly phase were there not so much because they were Jews, but because as individuals, the Nazis believed that they were a threat or had spoken out against them. Auschwitz was a terrible, nightmarish place, and many horrors besides the gas chambers occurred there. But for the most part, the Nazis attempted to keep a lid on mass violence that occurred in plain sight. There were so many people living in Auschwitz that an uprising was a real threat. And most of all, the Nazis didn't want to start a mass panic or riot when they were trying to lull their victims into a false sense of security, before they were gassed by the thousands. At Buchenwald, especially before the war, the purpose was to instill terror in the regime, like Dachau, Belsen, and the women's camp at Ravensbrück, many of the first inmates of the camps were released, most with the threat that anything they did that could be even considered remotely illegal would end with them back in the KZ system. They were also told in pain of death not to tell anyone about what they had seen or experienced while imprisoned. Many did not utter a word, but many did, and the Nazis didn't mind. They wanted rumors of terror to circulate among the German people. That way, they would be too frightened to protest or rebel. The Singing Forest Not far from the small crematoria at Buchenwald was the infamous stand of Singing Forest. This space was far enough removed from the camp to be out of public view, but close enough to be known and heard. It wasn't just the creaking sounds of the rope that came from the Singing Forest, it was the screams and groans of those tortured and killed there. And it wasn't just the trees that men were hung from. A gallows capable of hanging up to 20 people or more at a time was built in the trees right by the crematorium. Many of you know how gallows work from westerns or prison movies. A person is dropped through the floor, and the drop snaps their necks. 
it's a relatively painless way to go, if done right or humanely. Hangings at Buchenwald didn't happen so humanely. As you can see from the picture, prisoners were tied and hung from hooks just above the ground. Death could take 20 minutes or longer, and yes, as you can see in the background, the victim's death was sometimes observed by jeering guards and officers. The men in the photo were Polish patriots accused of participating in a plot that resulted in a German guard's stabbing death. Not everyone punished at Buchenwald was hanged by the neck. Many victims had their hands bound or cuffed behind their backs, and then to one of the trees, high enough so their feet barely touched the ground. Very quickly, their shoulders became dislocated, an excruciating injury. They were left there for hours, sometimes days. Many would die. Kapos and Ilse Koch In many, if not most, concentration camps, the Nazis often did not get their hands dirty when inflicting punishment on prisoners. Instead, they recruited other inmates to do their dirty work. These men, or women in women's camps or sections, were called capos, a shortening of an Italian term meaning foreman or crew chief. Capos were given unavailable or unthinkable privileges for other inmates, extra food, perhaps a private room or bed, occasionally women and more. And they were given lots of alcohol, which produced the desired result in the capos, extreme violence and sadism, though most of the capos didn't need it. They were hardened and sometimes sadistically psychotic criminals who enjoyed inflicting pain. The more pain, the more rewards. When the war ended, many capos were killed or severely beaten by the newly liberated inmates in every camp. Buchenwald was also infamous because of the wife of its longest serving commandant, Ilse Koch, married Karl Koch in 1936. Koch was commandant of Buchenwald from 1937 to 1941, when he became commandant of the Majdanek extermination camp. When 86 Soviet POWs escaped from Majdanek in late summer 1942, Koch was put under investigation for negligence, and through that investigation, offenses that had taken place in Buchenwald came to light. In a normal world, Koch would have been in prison for murder, but mass murder was a career-building achievement in Nazi Germany. Instead, he was found guilty of embezzlement, drunkenness, sexual offenses, and one murder of a man who had treated him for syphilis. The Nazis, particularly the SS, were okay with mass murder, but in the eyes of the almost puritanical Heinrich Himmler, head of the organization, thievery, drunkenness, and sexual crimes were unforgivable. Karl Koch was executed by the SS firing squad just days before the Americans liberated the camp. Koch's wife, Ilsa, was the unofficial co-ruler of Buchenwald while her husband was commandant, and while he was at Maidane. She ordered inmates shot because she disliked them. She is the one who allegedly had tattooed inmates gassed and skinned, their flesh made into lampshades. Witnesses swore she collected them, but historians are divided on the issue. Nonetheless, Ilse Koch was an extraordinarily sadistic person. She also used embezzled funds to build an indoor equestrian arena where she could ride her expensive horses. She would sometimes ride into the camp, and if any prisoner stared at her, she would often dismount and whip them across the face until they were unrecognizable. She was also accused of numerous other violent and financial crimes after a long, drawn-out process that lasted through two trials and ended with a life sentence. She committed suicide in prison in 1967. Buchenwald was also the site of some of the infamous medical experiments performed by the Nazis on prisoners. Most of the experiments at Buchenwald dealt with infection and disease, with inmates being intentionally infected and injected with various chemicals in the hope of finding a cure. The experiments, which included living autopsies, were performed with no anesthetic. Liberation When Americans liberated Buchenwald and its smaller nearby subcamps on April 11, 1945, there were about 40,000 survivors. By that spring in 1945, Buchenwald was filled beyond capacity with prisoners moved in from other camps who had been evacuated ahead of approaching Allied troops from the west and the east, and quite many women were in the camp by this point. Almost all the prisoners were emaciated, and many died from starvation, infection, and disease after liberation. Many had been shot just before the camp was liberated, but the Allied advance was so swift the SS did not have the time to kill or evacuate the rest of the prisoners. When the Allies arrived, they were greeted with profound joy and disbelief among the survivors. Still, some were just strong enough to gather together and toss one or two of their liberators in the air on a tightly pulled blanket trampoline. 
All around them were the bodies of thousands of unburied dead. This is History on Fleet, and we'll see you next time.